by Dr. Stephen Hughes. He's a professor of surgery and chief of surgical oncology at the University of Florida. Steve is a PI for the uh, uh, University of Florida site for the Consortium for the Study of Chronic Pancreatitis, Diabetes, and Pancreas Cancer. And he also serves on our board. Uh, and he's going to be talking about surgical principles to um, acute and chronic pancreatitis. Always perfect to um, cover such a small subject just before lunch. We'll have a, we'll have a good time here. Um, I'll try to keep everybody enjoying this. Um, I like the word principles in my title, so I'm going to try to really focus on that, and we're going to use some good randomized data to really drive home some key surgical principles, and then I'm going to have a little fun with some controversy with you, too, and hope that you can tell the difference. I don't have any conflicts. The subjects I really wanted to cover when saying trying to cover this waterfront of surgical role in the treatment of pancreatic disease was I wanted to bring up the role of uh, cholecystectomy in the setting of idiopathic pancreatitis. And I think it's an important concept that we don't really have our heads around, but I want to talk about it. The Poncho trial, which talks about same admission cholecystectomy for acute pancreatitis versus interval, which I thought was dealt with long ago, but still happens every day. I want to talk about our failure to recognize or uh, perform standard of care for severe pancreatitis, and that's something I see every day. Uh, the delayed presentation of the disconnected pancreatic duct and how it can leave patients kind of, what's the right word, simmering ill for up to three or four years. And then finally, I want to talk about the fact that surgeons really can help patients with chronic pancreatitis. So first and foremost, this is a fun study. It's a pretty simple little study. Let me walk you through it. It's from Finland. It was published in Annals of Surgery in 2015. And it's truly a randomized uh, multi-center trial. And it was really simple. They actually took 90 patients who came in with acute pancreatitis and had no clear etiology, including a negative ultrasound. And they randomized them to either get a random, to get a cold cystectomy or to go into observation. And what they found, and I'll cut right to the chase, is that after following them for three years, the recurrence of uh, acute pancreatitis was significantly higher in the control group than in the group that underwent laparoscopic cold cystectomy. And look at the difference, 14 out of 46 versus four out of 39 for a p-value of 0 0.016, as was the total number of recurrences. And in fact, 59% of the gallbladders that were removed did have sludge or very microlithiasis. And what they really came up with is the fact that is that if you did five cold cystectomies, you would save one patient recurrent acute pancreatitis uh, clinical course. Food for thought. Now this one gets even a little more simple. We've known this for a long, long time. Surgeons once upon a time learned that if you do a cold cystectomy in the face of acute severe pancreatitis that the morbidity rates are much higher. And so the standard of care, this is during my career, slid to, we'll do their goal of cystectomy after they go home and come back in six weeks, to which we quickly realized that a significant percentage of those people actually develop recurrent pancreatitis in that interval. The Dutch went ahead and did this study again, kind of re-asking the question, same admission versus a delayed uh, interval. And that was only two weeks in this study. Typical of them, all 713 patients that came through the door of their uh, centers in the Netherlands were screened, and, and typical of their studies, uh, a very clean population of 266 patients was ultimately chosen for about 140 patients in each group. And I'll cut to the chase. I know this table's a little busy, uh, but we'll get to that. They found a very significant difference in readmission and in recurrent symptoms. I'll focus right here. The recurrent pancreatitis group, even within two weeks, was up to 10%. It led to a significant readmission as well with, if you look at the top table, 17% uh, readmission versus five uh, with the same admission cholecystectomy. What's interesting is, is that within those two weeks, half the patients complained of recurrent abdominal pain. Um, so you sent those people home actually and they were suffering and, and probably having ongoing mild episodes of pancreatitis. So please encourage your surgeons to uh, see the patient the same day that they come through the emergency department with their acute pancreatitis, as long as they have a benign course or a non-severe course, get that gallbladder out as soon as they're pain-free and get them home. I think we've talked a little bit, but this is probably the, uh, the interesting aspect for me as a surgeon and where uh, we are um, starting to realize that the gastroenterologists have a significant role in this disease as well. And I think that was brought up with that axial stent comment just to our prior speaker. Here's an example of pancreatitis with peripancreatic fluid collections, and certainly there's necrotic material, but if you look at the gland itself, it's enhancing beautifully. And this patient was quite ill uh, with both respiratory and renal failure. Here's a patient 
whose the entire pancreas is basically dead. They have no symptoms. This was an outpatient that I scanned from home. This patient has early satiety that came into as a walkie-talkie. This patient presented two years later with a disconnected duct, which we'll get into later. This patient just had more of a phlegmon. And how about this? Can you see it going up and down the entire uh, left retroperitoneum? Pretty impressive fluid collection, but not particularly ill. And then once again, a patient that was terribly ill who has what appears to be a disconnected duct with a star showing the viable gland and the arrows pointing to the increase in fluid collection because the juice has nowhere to go. And then finally, sometimes these collections can go multiple different directions. Down the root of the mesenteries, you can see in the middle, in the left lower or left retrocolic region, and then also we'll see them extend from the head into the right retrocolic region. Much different problem. What I really want to drive home is, is that this is a disease that I see mismanaged fairly frequently, often by well-intended practitioners who don't know as much as they think they know about uh, neptizing pancreatitis. And most important thing to tell you is this is a two-phase disease. So in the first two weeks, this is SIRS. You're going to think they're infected. They've got to be infected. For the most part, they are not infected unless they have pneumonia. So you can keep an eye on their pulmonary toilet. But in most part, antibiotics play no role in the first two weeks unless you have clear criteria of a pneumonia. The infection comes later. And basically, the percent of necrosis equals the likelihood, percent likelihood that you're going to be dealing with infection. In general, due to multiple randomized trials, the role of prophylactic antibiotics are now out. The role for TPN, for the most part, is out based on randomized controlled trials. In fact, tube feeds are clearly in. Whether you need to put them post pyloric or into the stomach is a current debate. We put them beyond the pylorus mostly because we find a better total delivery of nutritional needs than if we do it in the stomach. The nurses are often turning off the tube feeds if we're feeding the stomach. It's not that it caused the pancreatitis to be worse, it's just you can't get the nutrition that the patients need in. The other thing that I should have on this slide, honestly, is also that early ERCP and severe pancreatitis for the most part is out. The step up approach, on the other hand, once again by the Dutch, is clearly in. But I want to emphasize, and this is what I often see wrong, somebody comes in, respiratory failure, renal failure, and they get a drain in the first two weeks. And I'm going to show you a scan here in a minute about why I would ask you not to do that. Not everyone needs one. What we use them for in the University of Florida is for the most part when we see someone deteriorate after that sort of two-week window, and what you'll typically see is people come in with respiratory failure, they'll be sick. They'll get that scan that shows that they've got a component in necrosis. And we just tend to their needs. We get a dop off tube in them, we feed them, we support any failing organs, we try to do goal directed resuscitation, and we keep away from antibiotics and other invasive procedures. And for the most part, you should see a general trend towards getting better. Um, if you start to see worsening organ dysfunction or decline in that sort of two to three to four weeks range, then we rescan them and typically just are prepared to place a drain regardless of the findings. And I think it'd be a fun thing for us to talk about. Uh, what people's strategies are. Once you place a drain, the vast majority of these folks we know are gonna go on to some sort of invasive procedure above and beyond our drain to deal with that. The other thing to tell you is that the patients that we've talked about who are asymptomatic, I showed you some of those scans, they are asymptomatic by, by four weeks. There's pretty compelling data that if your necroma or your walled off necrosis is causing you symptoms at four weeks, it is gonna to continue to do so until you deal with it. So we kind of look at four weeks and say, if you're not symptom free, it's time to start talking about what we're going to do. We do a cholecystectomy regardless of the etiology, mostly because of the work from Nick Zromsky in Indiana, showing that 80% of the folks who have an inside to bowel bladder, regardless of the etiology of their neptizing pancreatitis, wind up with biliary complications within one year for the onset of their disease. So if we're striking for their necrotizing pancreatitis, we do, if possible, take out the gallbladder. And this is a scan I wanted to show you. So this is an index scan at 72 hours of a patient who came in with isolated respiratory failure. Within five days was extubated, had basically was doing pretty well. We scanned them again at two weeks. This is the way things were headed. We had reinitiated a diet. Here at three weeks, you can see what their uh, peripancreatic and necrosis looks like. And here they were at a month. We continued to follow them, completely asymptomatic. Now I've seen many patients who show up in my clinic or in my ICU who have a drain like that within five days. And this option that they're just gonna get better is, is, has been destroyed because of that, because by definition now they have an infected necroma. 
Now, how bad are we at just following evidence-based guidelines? This was just a, something that I was noticing when I first got to Florida, uh, as we accept many patients in transfer. And so this was about 100 patients that were transferred in from the outside. And we just asked a simple question, how many of them got a CT scan with appropriate contrast at the appropriate time to really assess the extent of their necrosis? And it was 31%, meaning 69% really didn't have appropriate imaging to really prognosticate or, or manage them. If we asked how many of them were receiving antibiotics in the first two weeks, just empirically, it was 79%. And then finally, if we looked at how many of them were actually getting TPN, it was 60%. And this was clearly in the face of randomized trial data showing that these are three steps that really were no longer appropriate. <laughs> Let's take a couple of seconds and let that kind of digest. Now, we have a number of options about taking care of these patients in critical illness. Open bereavement, we know is out. This is a disgusting picture. We don't do this anymore. Percutaneous drainage is definitely in. The problem I'm seeing is that people are doing percutaneous drainage and letting people just uh, languish for months and months with drains and not allow them to completely get better. Uh, the Seattle group really kind of pioneered the Bard group a number of years ago, and then the, the, the Dutch have kind of uh, championed it. But as you saw, many patients do not have the collections that are anatomically friendly to a Bard approach. The transgastric necrosectomy is actually very popular surgically and is obviously very popular by uh, gastroenterologists because it's really the approach can be done with endoscopic uh, ultrasound guidance. And then there is, in fact, the option to do a combination. Just to emphasize a little bit about where we are with transgastric necrosectomy, um, there is a very compelling paper showing that it is an attractive option uh, because it offers one-stop shopping, you can really get a very thorough debridement. The likelihood that they're going to need to have endoscopic rescue after a surgical debridement is pretty low, and it's, it's just it's unfair. The surgeon's finger is just a lot easier to work with than some sort of basket or, or, or other forceps that the endoscopist is forced to use. And it also allows us uh, to be a little bit more aggressive in sorting out the demarcation between the dead tissue and, and viable tissue, and so there's less fear of bleeding. Um, we can provide the same durable internal drainage, and, uh, and for the most part, our own data would show that about 80% of the time when you should have a disconnected duct, in fact, a persistent fistula to the stomach forms, and these patients never require an additional procedure. Even if you placed a drain prior to doing a transgastric necrosectomy, at the time of the necrosectomy, we do remove the drain, so when these patients wake, they, they do not have any external drains, and that's a big deal because the percutaneous place drains, honestly, are quite painful. And when possible, we do the cholecystectomy, and oftentimes it is a biliary etiology, which is why we're there. It's always kind of a little frustrating, and I'm not really sure the answer. Um, when somebody does so much hard work, three or four endoscopic sessions to do a transgastric necrosectomy endoscopically, and then they refer the patient to me for a cholecystectomy. Um, and, and the reality is, is that they've got like a bomb went off in their belly. You can't do it laparoscopically, so they're going to get an open cholie anyway. And you kind of go, oh, well, I guess that was heroic. Um, and then finally, the other thing we can do is actually place a transgastric feeding tube at the time, which is honestly humane because then these patients get everything out of their nose and, and, um, and we get good enteral feeding. This is the size incision I use. I've kind of marked the breastbone and the belly button to show you that it's actually kind of an upper mini laparotomy. We open up a longitudinal gastrotomy and through that we can look right into the necroma. And here you can show a drain and how we've removed uh, the probably 80% of this particular patient's pancreas. And here you can see where I've placed a, a transgastric combination GJ tube where we can vent the stomach and feed distally. This paper is in the slide deck. It is by Nick Sramsky again, but actually from Chad Ball up in uh, Calgary, um, Canada. Uh, and it, it reviews almost a couple hundred patients that they've done surgically this way, showing that it can be done safely as a single episode with pretty impressive results. There is a randomized trial uh, comparing surgical dentist therapy that was presented at Pancreas Club and DDW recently. I, I could not find that it's actually published yet. I did not have the pleasure of viewing the paper. It purports, and it's from the Florida Hospital Group, that the endoscopic approach is associated with lower complications. Um, this is a paper from Pittsburgh, from Amr, and uh, from Dr. Papa Christou, who will be talking, who basically showed the real difference. And what I think we have to talk about is the time it takes to get people through this. The surgical approach in our experience has been that within 10 to 14 days after you do the surgical debridement, the patient is on to the next step. They are dispositioned. Whereas if you're doing uh, endoscopy therapy, it tends to be a few months until patients truly are through the, the recovery process. 
how does these people do long term? It, it, it's interesting, we don't know as much about it as we should. I can tell you many of my patients go back to riding Harley Davidson's or scuba diving, and many of them do in fact get back to work and have pretty normal lives, although many of them do have to face a new onset of diabetes or extra insufficiency, which will drag them through the rest of their life. But for the most part, I reassure them that you're gonna be sick for a few months, and then you're gonna get your life back, although you'll probably be a diabetic and probably need Creon. Um, and that's in fact, what happens. Uh, some of them definitely uh, develop some problems, and I think that's a big typo. The old data from 2005, the hernia rate was 100%. Okay, so um, the disconnected duct, just a couple of seconds on that before I run out of time. Paper from us, which was really upsetting to me. If you look at folks who were treated outside our institution who on their index scan of severe pancreatitis with necrosis clearly had a viable tail that was nowhere near being connected to the intestine. It was 284 days on average before that patient was referred to us. That's almost an entire year where they were ill, not getting better. If you look at folks who actually look like they got better, but then came back with imaging that clearly didn't, or they had an interval where they were okay, but they really weren't, it was three years, 981 days. These people typically had lost their jobs, they had lost their insurance, they had had drains placed and removed on multiple occasions. Um, and so I just want people to recognize, look for this. When you see that viable tail in, the, in a uh, contrast enhanced scan, notice it, pick it up, and, and those patients need to be treated differently. Okay, finally, chronic pancreatitis, is surgical therapy appropriate? Uh, yes, it is. I think the real question is, is at when? This is a wonderful paper by Dr. Bruno. I'll let you read the stuff on the side. Oh, I've got a few times, don't I? This clock's a little more, this clock's scaring me. All right, five minutes. Let's take the appropriate time to talk about chronic pancreatitis. <laughs> okay, so this is comparing endotherapy to surgical therapy. And at the end of the day, the surgical patients did a little bit better. Um, they, had, they reported a better quality of life. They ultimately received fewer procedures. They had better pain relief at the end of the day. Now, what we've done historically is surgery has been reserved for people in daily pain requiring narcotics and then with a large duct or with clearly one half of the gland involved and the other half spared. So really burnt out end of the road stuff. Thanks to the work of doctors Whitcomb and others, we now realize that chronic pancreatitis typically follows relapsing acute pancreatitis. And the real question we have is, is that where in that continuum is it time for a surgeon to get engaged? We think that certainly before you develop these centralized pain um, syndromes where the, you can take the entire pancreas out and the pains, you know, pancreatic perceived pain still persists. So I would much rather be talking to a patient who has got crescendo re, uh, relapsing episodes than somebody who's in daily pain. The options are resection versus longitudinal drainage with or without some component of resection like a Fry procedure. Or as I think it's uh, been championed by a number of folks in this group, uh, in this room today, the, the total pancreatectomy with islet autotransplantation. There's really mitigating factors influencing the procedure choice. And I'm not gonna say that I have a favorite, but I'm gonna tell you that they've not really been compared head to head very well, other than certain sort of drainage procedures to resection, like a beggar procedure to Whipple has gone head to head. And the reality is, is that it really came down to which is the surgeon done more of to decide which one's better. But as you're considering these things, the presence of a pseudocyst, you know, that prominent pancreatic head, perhaps even more worrisome, that notion that you now have a, a chronic pancreatitis degenerating into a malignancy, which can be a very diagnostic challenge. Um, the presence of duodenal stenosis or biliary stricture, genetic etiology, uh, these all sort of factor into which of, the, of these options should be considered. If you kind of pull this and this, I, I didn't even reference uh, the papers where this really comes from, and it, it's in general. If you look at this, the, the, the operations are fairly equivalent in their ability to reduce pain or eliminate the need for narcotics. And the overall quality of life is pretty similar, even for total pancreatectomy where you are an obligate excrement insufficiency, uh, you know, uh, person. Um, the new onset diabetes here isn't fair. Obviously, TPIAT has been following their patients, paying close attention to it. This is talking about like surgery just caused your diabetes. It doesn't really talk about the fact that ongoing damage to the pancreas probably leads to a much higher rate of diabetes in these patients. 
But the rest of the stuff is fairly similar, although PPIAT surprisingly does have a higher association with reoperation. So in summary, cholecystectomy may be indicated for all patients with acute pancreatitis. And I say this as a joke, it's also not even necessary. I think Dr. Wu brought up a very important point that some pancreatic cancers do present uh, with acute pancreatitis. So if ultrasound is negative, I would encourage you in the setting of acute pancreatitis to get more definitive imaging. Although you probably won't have to because all these patients seem to come through the ED with a CT scan on their chest anyway. Um, please get the gallbladder out during the index operation if there is stones or sludge. Um, I didn't really get into it, but I think everybody's accepted at this point that you don't strike within the first week or two of uh, a necrotizing pancreatitis. Much better off to strike around four to six weeks after the onset of the disease. Don't miss that disconnected duct. Don't let those patients languish for months and months and months. And finally, surgery works for chronic pancreatitis. We're just not sure which operation. And if you have any questions for me, if I can be any further assistance, uh, here's both my email and my cell phone. Please call me anytime. Thanks for your attention. I hope you enjoy it.